The troubles with the U.S. economy and the possible fallout were on full display today. A task force report told of states facing ever deeper budget holes, but the chairman of the Federal Reserve withheld any promise of immediate help. Ben Bernanke came before the Senate Banking Committee acknowledging that the economy has suffered a series of setbacks. A slump in hiring and job growth, a slowdown in manufacturing activity, and reduced spending by consumers. But while citing the trends, the Fed chair would not commit on if or when the central bank might act again to boost growth. We are looking very carefully at the economy, um, trying to judge whether or not uh, the loss of momentum we've seen recently is uh, enduring, um, and whether or not the economy is likely to continue to make uh, progress towards uh, lower unemployment and more satisfactory labor market conditions. Um, if, uh, if, those condition, if that does not occur, obviously we have to consider additional steps. Senators from the two parties pushed Bernanke in opposing directions. Tennessee Republican Bob Corker said the Fed should take no new steps, leaving it instead to Congress to fix what ails the economy. I think further actions actually take the impetus off us to act responsibly. And I, I candidly wish we had a chairman of the Fed that sometimes it would say, look, we're not doing anything else. Quit looking to us. I mean, are you tempted ever to say that to Congress? Would you not say that now? I don't think that's my responsibility. I've been assigned to do, uh, to focus on maximum employment and price stability, not to hold threats over Congress's head. Congress is in charge here, not the Federal Reserve. In turn, Democrat Charles Schumer of New York argued vote, nothing will get through Congress in this election year, so the central bank must act. So given the political realities, Mr. Chairman, particularly in this election year, I'm afraid the Fed is the only game in town. I would urge you now more than ever to take whatever actions are warranted by the economic conditions, regardless of the political pressure. Bernanke did urge lawmakers on both sides to reach a long-term deficit deal by January 1st to avoid automatic spending cuts and tax hikes. And party leaders insisted today they won't let that happen. We're not going to let anybody's taxes go up at the end of the year. American people don't deserve to watch this debate come down to the last minute. But the path to any compromise was far from clear. And with that in mind, a number of former political leaders from both parties, joined by several business CEOs, announced what they called a campaign to fix the debt. The group included Erskine Bowles, former chief of staff to President Clinton. If we do nothing and we barrel through this fiscal cliff at the end of the year, you know, we're going to have about $7 trillion hit this country right in the gut. And that is enough to put our country back into a recession. That we cannot have. Also today, a separate group, the State Budget Crisis Task Force, issued yet another dire warning, this one concerning the precarious fiscal health of many states. Richard Ravitch served as co-chair. Well, we are digging a very, very serious hole for ourselves. And the real victims of that are going to be the social services, uh, the infrastructure. That's what's being cut uh, already. The report looked at six of the most populous states, California, Texas, Illinois, Virginia, New Jersey, and New York. The problems they face include growing Medicaid spending and pension liabilities at a time when state revenues and federal grants aren't keeping pace. And it's to the last of these issues, the fiscal problems of the states, that we go into more detail on now. Richard Ravitch joins us, a former lieutenant governor of New York. He co-chaired the task force issuing today's report with former Fed chairman Paul Volcker. Also with us is Susan Uran, Managing Director of the Pew Center on the States. Welcome to both of you. Dick Ravitch, uh, what jumps out at this report is a sense that the situation is much worse than thought, much worse than states are willing to admit, and much worse than anybody seems to have a grasp on what to do with it. Am I, am I overstating the, the problem? No, you, no, you're not. And it's a function of, I think, three things. One, there are basic expenditures like Medicaid and retirement expenditures, which, is, which are growing at a faster rate than state and local revenues. Number two, states for a long, long time have been using 
a gimmickry borrowed funds, proceeds of asset sales, to balance their budgets, and they've never been called to account by that. Wall Street's been willing to aid and abet that process, and uh, and out of perfectly valid and, and wonderful motives, people we've made a lot of commitments, but we've been unwilling to provide the revenues to match the commitments that we've made as a society. Well, uh, Susan Uran, you pick up on the revenue side because one of the things in the report is that they're not matching, but they're also they're also lower than they've been. There, there's a lot of things hitting the states. Well, it's absolutely true. I think revenues are down in, in part because of the fiscal crisis, but it's not just a short-term problem. If you look at the revenue base that states are dealing with, the tax base, what they have is a, they have a 20th century um, a 20th century tax system, but it's overlaid on a 21st century economy. So they're not taxing. Um, they're taxing an ever-diminishing part of what the economy is producing. So that means they're just gradually eroding in terms of revenue. And if you look out over the long term, it becomes a really serious problem. And political, politically untenable to try to do anything to raise taxes. Well, and certainly as you looked at the impact of the recession, the primary way that states dealt with the fiscal stress was cuts. Mm -hmm. The the uh, the the part, well, what would you add on the on the on the uh, revenue side of that? No, I think mm -hmm. Sue said it very very well. Uh, sales taxes are not growing because more and more transactions take place on the internet. Uh, gas taxes, which <clears throat> finance a lot of infrastructure expenditure, are not going up because the tax is based on gallonage and not on price, and people drive more fuel-efficient cars and buy less gasoline. Mm -hmm. uh, those states who have taxing systems that are geared to the federal system, uh, the, their revenues get adjusted when the federal tax system gets adjusted, so there's a lot more volatility. So uh, what Sue said is absolutely accurate. It, that's, it, that's one of the major that's one of the major problems in terms of the demands on the states and we've talked about this before on the program one in, you've been interested in is the the pension yeah. problem with pensions now fill that fill that picture in a little bit what what kind of uh, obligations are states uh, under and and under per, underpaying at this point well our last report showed about a 1.38 trillion dollar gap between what they have promised to pay that's pensions and health care mm -hmm. and what they actually have set aside to pay it so um, it's a long-term liability, but basically we've seen in, in increasing amounts of stress that states are facing on this. And it's not every state, but it's, um, it's a fair number of states across the country. So I think the states that, that Lieutenant Governor Ravitch looked at in his report are pretty representative of what we're seeing nationally. That, that's, go ahead. Uh, I have a lot of respect for, for the Pew Center's studies, but we think the problem is far more severe. We think just with respect to the OPEB, the health care liabilities to public employees, that the unfunded amount of that throughout the country is in and of itself in excess of a trillion dollars. And we think the underfunding of pensions the, depends on the interest rate assumptions you want to make about what those pension funds are going to earn. And if you assume uh, very, that they're going to earn seven and a half to eight percent, then the underfunding of pension funds is in the billion dollar category. And you're but if you assume, well, I, 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 we don't try to take a position on what the right interest rate uh, assumptions should be, but there are an awful lot of people who think in the economy that we're living in, which is like we're likely to be delevering for some period of time, that seven and a half, eight percent is not the correct assumption. But you're, but you're, you're also suggesting that states are, are using these pension funds to help mask. And you were talking about this earlier, mask the larger problem. That's a place, no, that, an attractive uh, place they can go. Uh, no, I think people are borrowing, uh, not for. Uh, uh, that reason, although in New York State they made the grievous mistake of passing a law which enables the state and the cities and the counties mm -hmm. to borrow from the pension fund to make the payments that they're statutorily obligated to mm -hmm. make. And in states like New Jersey and Illinois, there is no requirement that the state make the payments to uh, uh, assure that the, the funds are actuarially sound. Susan, we were looking, watching the rest of the other rest of the reports out today and the sort of fiscal cliff uh, fears. Is it not possible that these demands and the cutbacks to the states will get even worse? 
Well, I think there's a lot of uncertainty that states are facing as the federal government uh, begins to grapple with the deficit. Mm -hmm. The proposals that are going to be put forward are likely to have a significant impact on states. And one problem is that the federal government is not necessarily paying enough attention to what those impacts are going to be, but states will feel it when the federal government starts to cut. Um, federal, state, and local finances are all very intertwined. So, so what, do you, what do you call for? I mean, what, what can happen sort of quickly? Well, we don't attempt to tell the elected officials of this country how to apportion the cost of this between mm -hmm. the recipients of public services, public employees, or taxpayers, because uh, in a democracy, those are there's no absolute right or wrong answer. That's mm -hmm. a question that should be resolved through negotiation and compromise, and that's what our elected officials should be doing. But you're saying be clear about the problem. But I'm saying be honest about it. Stop using uh, borrowed money and proceeds from the sale of assets and treating them as revenues. Match your recurring expenditures with recurring revenues. Do five-year projections. To inform the public, uh, not mask the truth. Tell people that we are have a serious structural deficit in most states, that the cities and counties of the this country are going to bear the greatest brunt of this, and the impact is going to rest in most severely on education, on infrastructure investment. All right. Richard Ravitch, Susan Uran, thank you both very much.